The issue of reparations has finally penetrated national discourse, in part thanks to the presidential election. Uh, some Democratic Party primary contenders are saying that they support reparations. Um, but the conversation, it's not very nuanced in mainstream media. There's kind of a mention of it and then we move away. But we don't really know what reparations entails because a lot of people are just learning about it for the first time. And here with me now to talk about reparations is Michael Graham, otherwise known as MG from Actify Press. And we tried really hard to get this video out prior to the ADOS conference. Unfortunately, the last version that we recorded had a little bit of audio issues, so we are redoing it now because we really want you all to hear about this. So, Michael, thank you so much for coming back on the program. Uh, thanks. Thanks for uh, giving me another shot there, Mike. <laughs> so Sorry about the sound on the last one. You know, things happen. I have messed up so many mm -hmm. um, interviews before with tech issues and whatnot. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it, it's part <laughs> of the process. But, you know, what matters is mm -hmm. that we're still able to do this and get this out. And I hope, you know, kind of intrigue people to not just listen to this and then end the conversation there, but really dive a little bit deeper, do some more research. And if you look in the description box, we have a plethora of resources for you. If you want to learn more about reparations, learn more about the exploitation of black Americans, um, the history. There's so many resources. I have some articles from Michael Graham that he wrote, um, but hopefully this will be a conversation that kind of sparks your interest. So what I want to really do, Michael, is I think the most important thing is for us to define what reparations means, uh, materially speaking, because everyone kind of seems to impose their own view of reparations for purposes of political expediency. You know, there's some candidates mm -hmm. who they say they support it and maybe they do, but it's meager. Maybe they don't actually support it if you read a little bit closer between the lines. So so mm -hmm. in your view, what is reparations? What does that mean um, in terms of cash payment? Does that mean investments in the community? Can you break it down for us in a material sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me, let me go back a little bit. I, one thing I, I want to make clear is that reparations has been part of um, human interaction since the beginning of time. If you harm me, you do, there's some sort of recompense, some sort of... Uh, making things right between those two parties, right? So this that's all reparations is. We were harmed and the country never made recompense of, in any serious manner. And they gained, uh, demonstrably gained trillions of dollars and power and wealth from what, from our labor, from our intellectual toil. And we have gained the least from all those, all those efforts. So what reparations is, just like it was for Jewish people in the con that were in concentration camps or the Japanese in concentration camps and all these other uh, groups. It's just making making right what was done wrong, what was done wrong to to a group of people in this case. So it could be it can come in several forms. Right. There's, of course, there's cash. There is land. There is apology. There's so many things that can be done to make things right. Uh, but in this case, one of the biggest sticking point for a lot of Americans is the cash reparations. And I don't understand. Well, I understand race is a big part of that. Um, why the cash is is uh, is is an issue for a lot of people, because uh, money is power and a lot of people don't want to see us with power. But yeah. that's basically what reparations are making, making good on, on what on uh on what what was what was what was done wrong and trying to trying to make up these. And right now, the biggest issue is the wealth gap. Not the income gap, which is different. The wealth gap is the biggest issue because that's where a family's uh, or an individual stability comes from. And right now, um, and I wrote it in my last article uh, on nativism, is that we're facing, we're truly facing genocide in this country. So uh, we have to um, be honest about that and approach that from that standpoint. And when you talk about genocide, um, something that we prior uh, discussed was if you look yes. at the U.N. definition of what constitutes genocide, yes. your argument mm -hmm. is that black Americans beat three out of the five at a minimum. Can you explain that at a little minimum. bit? OK, I read directly from the Convention on the Prevention of Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. This is Article two from the from the U.N. Commission. So here, here are the, the five things killing members of the group causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting the, on the group conditions of, of life calculated to bring about the physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children uh, of the group to, uh, to another group. Now, B, um, A, of course, uh, killing members of the group. We, we see that every day. We see it with... Um, Yes, black on black crime does exist, but that goes back to C, 
which is de uh, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction, which is what happens when you push a bunch of people together in a small space, concentrate upon and, and, and take all the resources out of that space. You concentrate the poverty, people will get violent. It happens all over the world. It happens in the tower blocks of London. It happens in the favelas of, of Rio. It happens in the on the streets of, of, of Hong Kong. Wherever you have a concentrated group of people and, uh, and concentrated poverty, you're going to have violence. The more concentrated the poverty and the more concentrated and the, the larger the um, inequality is, the, the stronger the, the violence is going to be. And it's, of course, because it's contained, you people harm people who were in their group, forcibly transferring children uh, of the group to another group. Now, um, that's that's one that people probably don't even notice. But our foster care program, children are pushed into foster care because um, fin finances is the biggest reason why people give up their kids. Finances is the biggest reason why people don't have enough money to take care of their children. Right. So we're going back to deliberately inflicting the group on the group conditions the light of life calculated to bring about the physical destruction of whole or in part. It's a vicious cycle and we're facing that right now. And if we don't, as American descendants of slavery, we don't have any money, therefore we don't have any power. Uh, or we have our vote, but um, the powers that be spend a lot of time and money to misguide our vote in the directions that they want them in order to help whatever they want, as opposed to helping us. Yeah. Right. So that's 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 my that's my that's a view of genocide based on international law. This is not what Michael Graham says. This is not what the ADUS community says. This is not what anybody. This is what the law says. What I think you you kind of touch on in your articles that I think is really important is well, we live in a capitalist system. In a capitalist yes. system, wealth directly translates into power. By 2050, mm -hmm. what's going to happen if we do not change income inequality and the disparities in wealth between whites and blacks? Yeah, well, 2053, we, we're facing um, the, will be, black Americans will be at zero wealth. Right now, we average $1,700 per family if you take out um, the, the uh, durable goods. Um, so, um, like cars and, and cars and, and, uh, clothing and, and furniture and stuff like that. We're down to $1,700 in, in the United States. And now, of course, there's places that are a lot worse, like in Boston, we're down to $8 of wealth. Um, in, uh, in LA, I believe it's 200, two or $300, um, in, in wealth, which in LA is like having nothing, you know? So in it's places, this issues like that, and it's not, and it's not, based on our color it's based on our the fact that we are descendants of slaves because there are african people people who are or who were born and raised first second generation from the african continent who also live in in or around these these communities but they have much more wealth because they brought wealth in or the and or they've been allowed to access wealth more than us based on our history or based on people trying to hold us down based on our history and, and I wanted you to kind of touch on the different types of arguments for reparations, because I think that really there's mm -hmm. a, a multitude of ways that you can approach this. There's the moral argument that this is mm -hmm. a wrong Absolutely. that has never been written. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan is actually the president, surprisingly enough, that signed reparations into law for victims mm -hmm. of Japanese internment during World War II. Yes. So this is something that we've we've never righted a wrong for. So there's that moral mm -hmm. argument. There's also the legal argument and really acknowledging that this dates back to slavery, but it doesn't stop after slavery. We're talking Absolutely about Jim not. Crow. We're talking about mm -hmm. segregation, redlining. So the legal yes. argument is what I think can persuade people who don't buy into the moral argument. And I feel like the moral argument in and of itself is mm -hmm. persuasive but if you want to get like the wonks and the centrists on board then i think that the legal mm -hmm. argument is incredibly important and i i feel like it's foolproof now in terms of this being a debt owed how do you make that case how do you say legally speaking this is sound and this is something that is long overdue okay well we, as you said there's a there is a nearly unbroken chain of horrible policy and practice from the United States from 1696. But in this case, we'll start from 1776 because there was no America prior to 1776. So there was slavery 
Um, then, then there was a civil war and there is a tiny sliver of time where we had reconstruction and then white terrorism erased that the right white terrorism and the assassination of Martin, of Martin Luther King, the assassination of, uh, of Abraham Lincoln, uh, erased the, all those gains, uh, and pulled the rug out from other Southern blacks and whites who were, who were rebuilding uh, the South after, after the uh, civil war. And then falling right back into that puts us right into the Jim Crow era, which is a, which is a hundred and a hundred plus years, I forget what the number is, a hundred plus years. And that drives us into the sixties. And during that time period, we, there, there were, there were over 4,000 lynchings, which is the, which is how, which is part of the violence and terrorism that they use to keep Jim Crow in place. There were over 4,000 lynchings that have never, ever, ever been, uh, been prosecuted. 4,000 black people were killed in violent, violent terrorist actions from, from the, from the white community. And none of that has ever been prosecuted. All right. So, we have that where we couldn't we couldn't own property, or if we did have property, it could be taken away from us. We had sharecropping during that time. Uh, if uh, those who those who managed to get their forty acres in a mule, that was taken back. Uh, communities that built that built up built their own communities, and, and white folks came and tore that down and took it away. It was just it was just horrible, absolutely horrible. So now we hit Jim at the end of Jim Crow, quote unquote, the end of Jim Crow, which puts us at the civil the end of the civil rights movement. Um, puts us into 65 and 67. In that time period, we had the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. We also have um, uh, Linda B. Johnson signing, um, using a, a um, executive action to institute affirmative action, which was great. Uh, for and, and it was affirmative action was specifically, specifically for the descendants of slaves. All right. So within a year, they found a way to dilute it. They added women to it. Not to say that women aren't downtrodden, but white women. This was a this was a, a funnel to to take the, the resources out of these programs and funnel them right back into the, the white community through white women. Okay, so so we're talking about since other than that those that sliver of time in Reconstruction, and from the time that uh, Linda B. Johnson put um, put affirmative action into in place. So we're talking about reconstruction and a, like a 10 month window where we had for action to ourselves, right? Beyond that, that is the absolute closest we've, we've had to full citizenship since we've been here, since we've been on this continent. And when you see it like that, when you see, when you see that framing of where we are in the United States, it's case closed. I, there's really no way to back away from that. I think that part of the issue is that People aren't really conceptualizing this in the correct way. Like one of the biggest things that I see against mm -hmm. reparations is that, well, there's no slaves alive today. And of course, you just explained how it's not just about slavery. But the way that I see it is when a debt is owed, that doesn't go away when, you know, the individuals who um, are owed something die. Right. So, for example, mm -hmm. like I have a lot of student loan debt. If I die, that's not going to go away. It's just going to be transferred to my husband, debts carry on after somebody yes. passes away. I mean, my dad, he has an uncle that he never met, I don't think, maybe once or twice, who had mm -hmm. land in Hawaii. It was like a meager five acres or something like that, but he found out about it after he died. Mm -hmm. And then when that property was sold, him and his uh, siblings split that. So, you know, a debt, it doesn't just go away with time. It's something that carries on. It does not. And people need to acknowledge that and if they see it that way, I think that legally speaking, it makes more sense. If they don't, you know, um, understand the moral argument, which I feel like the moral argument, it, it's it's basically a no-brainer. It's just a matter of people kind of use legal rationale to kind of explain away the need for reparations when that's not really a way to dismiss it easily because you're still wrong. But I wanted to talk about, because the thing about reparations is that, as I kind of alluded to, we don't really get these complex conversations about it. And it's no, really nice to see presidential candidates like, you know, Marianne Williamson talking about it. Although I will say it's disappointing that, you know, a white woman is the face of reparations when we have black leaders like Yvette yes. Carnell mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. Antonio Moore who founded this movement and they don't really get credit. But really what they've kind of um, helped to demonstrate to people is that this is important to view it in terms of 
a black agenda, right? Like we can't just mm -hmm. lump in black people and people of color because there are different needs for different communities. So what they try to do is bring to the forefront a black agenda saying these are the things specifically that we need that will mm -hmm. help our community, that will save our community. But it is important that the way that, you know, the, the organization and mm -hmm. the uh, momentum grassroots behind this has kind of just sprung up seemingly out of nowhere. That's actually a mischaracterization because it's been there. There's been mm -hmm. a, a need for this. There's been an urgency for it. It's just that finally it is coming to the forefront. But I want to ask you, because since Marianne Williamson is kind of the face of reparations, and I do view her as an ally, she spoke at the Eidos conference, mm -hmm. but in yes. my view, I feel as if her approach to reparations, while it's correct legally, and, um, you know, in, in the way that she's framing the argument, I feel like it's a bit too meager. Um, but I mm -hmm. kind of wanted to talk through, like, is she is she hitting all the marks? Is she doing a good job? What is your take on Marianne mm -hmm. Williamson? Yeah. Well, let me, I'm sorry, Mike. Let me go back for a second. You were talking about the, the debt. Well, I'll come back to Marianne Williamson. I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> we were talking about, you were talking about the debt and how debt is debt 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 transfers just 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 the way wealth transfers mm -hmm. just like poverty is 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 passed on down passed down through generations um the, or the lack of wealth is passed down through generations right so something we have to keep in mind right recently there was a study 60 this, the largest transfer of personal wealth is about to happen over the next 25 years in the United States from boomers to millennials we're talking 68 trillion dollars are going to be transferred um and 45 million, 45 million households, there's going to be $68 trillion transferred to, um, from, from millennials, I mean, from boomers to millennials. And the vast majority of those families are white families because that's where all the wealth is, right? So that we have to keep that in mind. A lot of people are saying, well, um, are saying that, that, well, well, black folks, they had their chance, whatever, you know, they had welfare and whatever, whatever X, Y, Z. We did not have a chance to pass on that kind of wealth like white folks get ready to pass, pass on to their kids, even though we did the work. We always have done the work. And here we are. We're looking at sixty eight trillion dollars over the next 25 years going from boomers to millennials that we're looking at. Moving on. Mary Winston. <laughs> Mary Williamson, she is a she's an outstanding ally. She is courageous. Um, she I, I, I like the fact that she is full throated about her her uh, position uh, about fighting for for reparations. Although although her numbers are small, because she's concentrating. I guess she, uh, what she said in the, in the conference was that she's concentrating on what is what she believes is politically politically viable. Um, I believe what's politically politically viable is what you fight for. All right, um, just. Like um, was it three, four years ago, uh, Medicare for all wasn't politically viable. Now everybody's scrambling to try to find a, med a Medicare for all plan or Medicare uh, Medicare for all light plan. Right? Yeah, so, that's a um, great what's, point. What's, and and what's politically viable doesn't matter. It's where and and I think Harvard did the study. You know, was it Stanford that did the study that what people in the street think about what have what policy goes through means nothing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like sixty percent of policy goes through, and the people in the street don't even want it. Yeah, that's right. a Princeton know, study, know. actually. Doctors yeah, Gillens and Page. Okay, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So the argument that um, well, most Americans don't want that. That's not an argument at all. Mm -hmm. Right? This is about what people with money want, which doesn't which doesn't really help us. But the argument of if people don't want it, it shouldn't. Ha it's not going to happen. That's that doesn't fly either, right? Because this is a debt. Okay. So her pro for for what's again back to Mary Williamson. The biggest issue is she wants to concentrate on the forty acres and the promise of the forty acres and the mule. Which is a very concentrated pom promise of four million people didn't get their forty acres in the mule. Four million former slaves in the United States didn't get their forty acres in the mule, and that was what they could have, as we've talked about before. That's what they could have, could have, they could have received, and if they had the opportunity to, they could, they would have been able to protect it and grow that wealth just like white families did. Okay, and then of course pass that on to to further generations. Now here, here we are, nearly forty million um, African Americans. Well, of American descendants of slavery, uh, and we're dirt poor for the most part. Yeah, some some black folks have some money, yay, but the vast majority of us are struggling paycheck to paycheck if they're lucky enough to be getting a paycheck. So uh, I think Mary Williamson is on the right track as far as that portion of the reparation argument is concerned, or reparations case is concerned. But there is a vast majority of things um, like peonage, um, uh, convict leasing. Uh, and even even now we have the, the even in, in the modern modern times we have the drug war 
which uh, which tar which clearly was targeting black communities. We had, and after the the drugs were, were flooded into the communities, we have um, mass incarceration, which is which piggybacked off the drug war. It seems that every step of the way, our bodies are used for white folks to make money, and we never gain. And folks want that to continue for some odd reason. Because white supremacy is just so ingrained in every single component Absolutely. of society and institutions. And it, it's it's so like, it's really difficult to undo a system that was built on that. So it's like, I really, mm -hmm. you know, I found the Eidos argument, like I've always been a supporter of reparations just as, you know, a good ally, but I never really took the time mm -hmm. to fully understand what that means and what that un entails. And even if I, I was already mm -hmm. kind of open-minded towards the idea, when you really see it put in very point of blank, like statistical terms, it really is eye-opening. Mm -hmm. Like I, I read the Eidos website, eidos101.com, and I kind Eidos. of had this like- yeah, it's a Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The website is is um, I I wrote I also wrote that in my recent article on nativism. It was it was it was a um, it was so sobering. You know I I, yeah. I thought I was knowledgeable, mm -hmm. but when you look at those numbers and the way they pull out the data, it's not and it's not, and it's not intended to uh, as some folks were saying is that not intended to fire people up and make them feel bad about our situation. It was about mm -hmm. telling the truth. Right, and right. And that's what the left is supposed to be about. Right. Mm -hmm. The left is supposed to be about, okay, let's, let, here's the facts. Let's lay out an argument and let's, let's try to get it fixed. Right. And that's what, well, that's what the left used to be about back in the day. Anyway, we, we, uh, and that's only when it comes to, um, the American descendants of slavery is the left not like that. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a big issue for me. That's why I've, uh, shifted most of my energy, um, to fighting for, or ADOS and because you know it's my family that's where my my sons my sons um no matter what my um what my parents have done no matter what what I have done no matter my, what my wife's family has done um my sons have a 75 percent chance of falling into poverty and one of them right now is headed that way my eldest right no yeah. matter what we did no matter what no matter how many resources I have they as individuals are are more likely to fall into poverty simply because they descend from slaves nothing else it's not race it's not um ethnicity it's not you know the color of their 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 car if they, when they have yeah. one right it's none of that garbage right it is that it is that they descend from slaves because this country has a hard on for harming us and it's really that simple yeah, and the situation shouldn't be bleak. And I think that really what what was very persuasive to me is the sense of urgency that I felt when I read it, you know, about mm -hmm. black wealth disappearing by 2053, about how mm -hmm. the situation is getting exponentially worse. Um, so yes. I, I think that it does a really good job at, you know, one, educating people and two, spreading awareness. And I feel like if you're not necessarily uh, on board yet, but you're open minded, then doing the mm -hmm. research in and of itself will do wonders because it, it really mm -hmm. is empowering to to learn about this and really realize the full history and get the context of mm -hmm. what has happened to descendants of slaves in this country. And it, it's really sad. So we kind of got our feet wet a little bit, but this is such a gigantic mm -hmm. issue. It's complex. Yeah, it's so massive. aside yes. from recommending that people go through and read the resources that we have in the description box, what I want to ask you mm -hmm. is, as white allies, as non-white allies, what can we mm -hmm. do to promote this issue rather than just saying i support it i mean what else could, how do we go further and be mm -hmm. good allies i think one of the biggest things is um be prepared to do some work right um there's, there's boots on the ground uh, do your homework obviously like we just said yeah definitely and, and be fearless in your circles if you don't take anything else from what i say uh in this this particular um uh, interview or anything i've written if you, the biggest thing for me is be fearless in your circles, go back and tell these folks that are, that are uh, on the right, left or center, um, wherever they are, tell them that reparations is the right thing to do. And here are the reasons why, bam, 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 bam. These are fellow Americans are going through X, Y, and Z and our policy and practice caused it. And at no point in time in this, in our history, have we had enough power to cause this to ourselves. So this is a, this was something that was inflicted upon uh, the, uh, the American descendants of slavery, and as the the the, uh, the the entity that inflicted that on these on on the American descendants of slaves, we have the duty and responsibility to fix it because they we do not there are no policies in place for us to fix it ourselves. 
um, uh, the uh, Dr. Sandy Darity from Duke and Antonio Moore and several other um, economists did a study and all these things that we were told would get us out of poverty, um, you know, buying home, saving, not spending on rims and sneakers, as they say, that bullshit. Um, and um, all those things that we, we've heard that would get, get us out of poverty, none of them work. None of them work. Um, I, I, I forget the name of the study. I think you, I, Mike uh, put it in the um, in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, uh, it'll definitely yeah, be there. Yeah, and and all, none of those things work because they do not show in the data, right? That they, they don't. It doesn't show up in the data. Fa- families that that stay together, um, uh, that you know, pa- nuclear families that stay together, and everybody gets a high, at least a high school education, and they're working. Wealth levels are still massively below white people who do the same thing. So all these things uh, that we're told that would fix this, um, were, and they were put in, like Nixon put in place, uh, black capitalism. That was his big thing. Um, we're going to do give them, you know, give them black capitalism, and so so they think they're getting somewhere, and and we didn't get anywhere, um, you know, and and all these other fixes that are supposed to be um, gems of of. Of, of wisdom in order to build wealth they're all bullshit at the end of the day another mm-hmm. thing that i kind of wanted to touch on real quick before we um close up here is um one thing that i think makes this issue especially more difficult to sell to people is mm-hmm. that it's not like other policies like medicare for all like I- if i'm promoting that i tell somebody how that impacts them from a really mm-hmm. concrete individual standpoint but with this issue when it comes to reparations I think that people incorrectly view this as a zero sum game where mm-hmm. descendants of slavery, they get something, but I don't get something as someone who's white. When in actuality, mm-hmm. that just shows me that we haven't been doing a good enough job at pitching this because in actuality, this is not a zero sum game. This is mm-hmm. a win for everyone. And this is truly um, trickle up economics because if we Absolutely. increase purchasing power of black Americans, then that mm-hmm. benefits the aggregate economy. So I feel as if, Absolutely. you know, giving up and saying, well, this doesn't have public support. I don't think that that is persuasive enough because we always start from somewhere. Medicare for all was not as popular as it is. Yes. The death penalty is still uh, not uh, there's most Americans don't support a repeal of it. It's getting closer, mm-hmm. right? But that doesn't yeah. necessarily it's mean. It, yeah, yeah it, that doesn't mean that we give up. That doesn't mean that we just no, say, well, you know what? Not. We we don't have the public support that we need. So we stop. That just means that we have our work cut out for us. And that means that we need to go mm-hmm. further in educating people. And really, like what I would say is educating yourself is the first step because you can't mm-hmm. persuasively argue for reparations if you don't know the mm-hmm. statistics, if you don't know how grim the situation is for American mm-hmm. descendants of slavery. And that in and of itself is a huge first step that uh, you can take, mm-hmm. I think. I, I mean, I don't know if you wanted to yeah. add to that. Absol- yeah, I, well, I, I agree that the first step is, is education, but uh, but the the moral argument you can do without the education, right? That's so true. That's I, true. I, I, don't, I don't want you to I don't want anybody to wait until I, you know, they're a scholar on the <laughs> right, right. or the, the plight of black people in the United States. The moral argument is clear. Yeah. Um, it can be as concise as you want it to be. And it can be, all right, we had slavery. We had Jim Crow. We had for a split second, we had civil rights movement that, that got us closer to, um, to, to parity with, with our, our white brethren uh, in the country. But then we had the drug war, we had um, mass incarceration. So we have never, never American descendants of slavery have never seen full citizenship. They've never had a full opportunity to gain wealth in this country, point blank period. There's really no way, there's no other way to view this. And the moral argument is we need to make that right. And that includes cash payments because you can't make up a wealth gap without cash. You just cannot. Yeah, and, you, and um, raising people's income that sounds good on paper, but you're raising everybody. You know the minimum wage argument. Mm-hmm. You're raising, but you're raising everybody's income. That means okay, if, if there's a gap and everybody's wages go up, guess what? That gap is goes unchanged, right? Or slightly, or changes slightly, right? So, um, and that's you know, and that's one of my many frustrations with the left when it comes to this this discussion. Uh, as like you were saying before, people tend to give up. Looks too hard. Let's leave it alone, right? I think mm. that's bullshit for a lot for a lot of folks. I totally I know agree. A lot of folks know better. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of folks know better, but they're choosing not to. You know, I don't mind. Well, I'm gonna call them, some of them a racist. I mean, it is what it is. The left has has their share of racists, and like you said before, white supremacy is ingrained deeply in the United States. And yeah, it's really it's global, right? But it's deep in the United States, and 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 a lot of people think that 
um, to it, and it's true to a degree that money insulates them from us and our, our problems. Mm-hmm. Right? right, and it does insulate them. You know, we our problems are elsewhere. I mean, that's what uh, pushing us into separate communities was all about. Our problems are there is no um, shared uplift. Right, there was the the whole um, the rising tide lift all boats argument. But no water's going to our yeah. <laughs> in our spaces, right? All the water's yeah. going to other spaces. How are we going to lift all boats, right? Because you know we're living, you know we're living in a space where we're not getting anything. As a matter of fact, most of the resources are being pulled out through um, uh, through um, over policing. You know, dri- driving up that's driving up costs through um, incarcerating people, um, tickets, all kinds of stuff, and, and all this stuff is going on in the black communities that that are pulling resources, even now, pulling resources out of, out of um, uh, black communities that's happening right now at this moment. We, we just had the, um, the crash in 08, 09. See, Jess, I'm getting old, Jess. <laughs> in 08 and 09. And nobody went to jail for targeting black, and in this case, black and Latino uh, um, um, uh, people who wanted to, who wanted to buy a house. Mm-hmm. Nobody went to jail for targeting, for targeting us, right? And that none of this goes punished. And that's part of the problem is that um, government has lost its taste for even a little bit for fighting for us. Not even, nobody fights for us. Not nobody in power fights for us. If you look around, there is nobody fighting for the specific needs of the American descendants of slavery community. Not a single person in power, not a single group in power is fighting is fighting for us. None. And we are the most important voting bloc voting block in democratic politics and in, on a national and state level. How does that happen? How does that happen? It's got, it's, I know how it happens. It's, it's specifically, it's, it's specifically targeting us for the end, right? You, you, you don't, you don't want us to make our own decisions. You don't want us to have any wealth. You don't want us to uh, grow. You don't want us to have our own businesses. What's left? What's left? And, and for people to, quote unquote, left us to, to look at this situation and ignore it, or even worse, um, attack us for wanting more for our, for, for wanting a future for our children is absolutely vile, absolutely vile. And um, I don't, you know, I don't know how this country plans on going forward without fixing this problem. And, and it's the sad thing is that most people don't want to fix the problem. And yeah, I, you know, we, we've um, a lot of it is like we said said early is that people don't understand the problem, but for a lot of folks, that's not an excuse, mm-hmm. especially for those of us on the left. It's not an excuse. Well, and, and the reason why I've kind of like mm-hmm. really started to be more passionate about it and not just you know be a passive white ally because that's what yeah. I feel like I should do, is yeah. because you know. It's hypocritical to not support this issue if you think Mm -hmm. big in all other areas. And I get that there's this Mm -hmm. sense that, okay, well, we're going to be accused of being too far left. The minute like reparations even came up in 2020, there was already the Fox News segments Mm -hmm. about how far left we're going and how how crazy we are. about everything, yeah. Exactly. About having fire departments, eh? It doesn't matter what they say. (laughs) Exactly. It's too far left. Exactly, exactly. And and, like the whole... Uh. The whole like I and I do understand like right trying to be sympathetic. Um, I get it. Like we we finally moved the needle on Medicare for all. We moved the needle on the Green mm-hmm. New Deal. We have public support. So now it seems like okay. Well, what if we go too far and ask too much? Will we delegitimize ourselves? But what people need to realize is that we are at a really crucial point in history mm-hmm. where we've got eleven years left to act when it comes to climate change. Um, mm-hmm. We are facing rising fascism in the United States of America, uh, mm-hmm. white supremacy, um, violence against blacks and people of color it is Mm -hmm. it's really terrifying to see so now is not the time to limit our thinking and limit you know what's possible Mm -hmm. now is the time to think big and accept things radical changes that would actually uh help people in this country and it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter if we have these universal programs that are phenomenal but if you truly care about targeting that wealth gap that disparity between descendants Mm -hmm. of slaves and everyone else you have to address that specifically and i think that ados has done a fantastic job at saying Mm -hmm. that look it's great all these you know universal policies uh targeting you know uh, people of color generally speaking that's all fantastic but if we want Mm -hmm. to stop this issue 
and um, stop what's been happening, the exploitation of black Americans uh, mm -hmm. disproportionately, you know, descendants of slaves. This is what we have to do. Um, so yeah. I think it's really persuasive. And I really I I'm thankful that people like you are speaking up so vocally because you have mm -hmm. to really yell to get people's attention sometimes. And I think that the Absolutely. Eidos movement has been very effective and I really commend Absolutely. them for it. Yeah, there's, a, there's been a lot of guerrilla journal, journalism and, and guerrilla politics uh, coming from um, the um, from the ADOS community. And and for people with no resources and no power, this is what people have to do. You know, it, it's, it, we don't have um, we don't have a bunch of folks that we can send uh, journalists with with TV vans to go to everything. We get, you know, yeah. we're, we're we got cell phones and, and our voices. That's all we got. And, and that goes back to allies being courageous in their circles yeah. uh, if you if you're in a, a space where people are poo-pooing reparations you've got to stand up and say something mm -hmm. you know uh it can't be well maybe they have a maybe they have a point it is kind of hard no no everything is hard until you freaking do it yeah right um and that's the biggest issue for me people are gonna have to be courageous and even if you um there were a lot of voices saying that um that ADOS was a was a uh, fascist plot to bring down Bernie and all this other madness. If you don't see that that was wrong, if you don't see that by now with Cornell West um, standing standing by um, the most one of the most courageous people in for for the rights of poor people in this country is standing with ADOS. If you can't see that, I don't know what to tell you. I, well, a lot of folks are just using it as we're using it as, as an excuse. Yeah, they're gonna say they're gonna say the corner west of all people got paid off. Whatever bullshit excuse they're gonna. Oh buy. yeah, corner yeah, west yeah. is like the most. Uh, you know, it, yeah. he has the most the integrity out of anyone. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. He was shredding Obama for eight straight years. Yeah, and on based on his policy, and and you know there are all kinds of people that are standing. Um, with this, um, with the ADOS uh, community, um, and our and and the uh, and I, I must say, I just just released a, a podcast, um, just me talking more or less, of um, of about leadership, about black leadership, and uh, praising Antonio Moore and 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 uh, uh, Yvette Carnell for their forthright and fearless leadership, mm -hmm. because too often, um, and there's a clip in there of. Malcolm X talking about the leadership during the civil rights movement about how it was, it was the, the leadership was stood up um, because black folks were, were uh, uh, choosing other paths, we'll say, <laughs> of, yeah. of making their voices heard. Uh, folks were getting hurt, uh, buildings were burning down, and black folks were not playing. So powers that be uh, put some more um, quiet voices out in front, all right? Mm -hmm. But even those voices got radicalized after a while, like Martin Luther King, he got radicalized after a while. So, oh, wait a minute, we got to talk about economics. And of course, that was the end, end of, uh, of, of, the, of the good doctor. But in any event, again, that go, I had to say again, you have to be courageous in your circles. Yeah. You, don't have to, you don't have to like Yvette. You don't have to like Antonio. You don't have to like their tone. None of that. You don't have to like me. But if you are for justice, and you're in this activism space and you're not behind reparations, there is a problem. Not enough groups are helping us. Mm -hmm. Nobody's no, no groups are on our side. The, the um, just recently um, Trump signed a, a, um, a bill for um, Pacific Islander and Asian American inclusion in the, in the economy. Not a word was said. Nobody said anything about, about specific policy to help people. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's that's the thing. Those are the types of things that bother me. So we can't do the same thing for for black people for the descendants of slavery. We can't do the same thing for us. But when it comes to us, we are quote unquote political poison, unless you want our votes. But that's going to change now. No black agenda, no vote. It is what it is. You know, I, and and shutting us out and well trying to shut us out and try to shut down these arguments. It's not going to work, especially as bad as you need these black these black ass votes for to win to win the presidency and to win at the state level in many states. 
It's yeah. going to change, and it slowly is changing as we speak. Well, the Overton window just in this election cycle, I think, has shifted dramatically. On not, oh, I mean, not just reparations, oh but a God. ton of yes, issues. It and it, this is the first time I really feel optimistic. Well, I shouldn't say I feel optimistic because overall mm -hmm. I'm cynical. I've got a cold heart. But I mean, mm -hmm. it, I see like there's a little bit of a light, like a glimmer of hope at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah. it's nice to see, you know, uh, a little bit of maybe goodness to come it, you know it's just a matter mm -hmm. of putting in the work and uh, that's why i really appreciate people like you and uh yvette carnell oh, antonio moore raising this issue because mm -hmm. you know without this type of in your face like hey pay attention finally tangibles 2020 like i wouldn't have Absolutely. really uh, felt the need to mm -hmm. do research i would have just felt like i i, I support it that's probably enough I, i'm comfortable mm -hmm. right but really yeah. forcing myself to go out of my comfort zone and really research it um it, it's mm -hmm. eye-opening you know it's this coming to jesus moment that i want everyone to have and that's why I will say one more time, please do not leave this video until you check out those resources in the description. Michael Absolutely. took the time to go through and carefully select a ton of different things that you will want to check out. Mm -hmm. um, Lefties like to read. Great job. Great opportunity to do some reading. There you go. Smarter. Yeah, there you go. Check out the resources, nerds. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, if you if you didn't have anything else to add, Michael, we uh, we can leave that there. No, I'm good, Michael. I want to thank you for being an ally. It's um, very, very important that we have allies. Um, and it's great that the, that, that, that the guys in independent media, uh, especially on the video side, because you guys get the most the most uh, attention. Um, and Tim Black also, he has Sandy Darity on his show recently. Oh. Um, and giving uh, ADOS a fair shot because that, that smear campaign that happened early on was painful, but... Um, glad we got it out of the way. It was going to happen eventually. I'm glad we got it out of the way, and people are and people like like yourself who are, who are being courageous and and being true allies and fighting this fight and offering your platform for this. I, I truly, truly, truly appreciate it. And well, please talk to your fellow your fellow YouTubers slash podcasters and everybody else. Again, be courageous in your circles. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Uh, I'm certainly trying, uh, but uh, it, it's I really you know it. thanks to you for really. Um, taking the time to explain this so articulately and eloquently and just and just making it known what's at stake right it's it's mm -hmm. easy to sit by and be complacent but for the people who speak out they kind of put themselves on the line and mm -hmm. you're doing a public service so thank you for that uh, it, it's been yeah. a pleasure michael